know that guy. And you're right, you don't know me. And there's no reason you should. Uh, but I do have to apologize to you because you do experience something as, a, as a, probably a direct result of me. And, and that's because when you swiped in to come to chapel today, you, you did so because there were people who at first would just say they went to chapel. I'm not saying I was one of those people. But then after a little while, they thought, well, we figured out that the baseball players would come in at the top, and then they would go out the bottom. And then they would go back to Crouch and Nuncook, wherever we were going. And I figured I could, I could hide amongst the 6'4 baseball players and swipe in at the top and then find my way out the bottom on my way to the bathroom and, uh, and, and limit my chapel experience. And I thought to myself as I was sitting here this morning, Fifteen years ago, I was trying everything I could to f- try to figure out how to get out of chapel, and here I am standing on the stage preaching the chapel message this morning. And so, I do know a little bit about you, even though I don't know you, because I was you. And, and because of all of that, I thought about what it was that I would say to you this morning. And so, guys, I'm going to give you a little bit of a jump start on your relationship with, uh, with women. And women, I'm going to give you a little insight into uh, your relationship or ultimate relationship with uh, a young man. And, and that comes in the form of understanding the difference between pondering and thinking. And so, if, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, nor do I mean this in a sexist way, but I want you to understand that guys and girls are different. Oftentimes, what we'll see is that guys do a lot of thinking, and girls do a lot of pondering. And so I'm going to define this in a particular way to help us to understand why I think we need to do a little bit more of both, but also to help you understand each other a little bit. So pondering, I will at least define it this way. This morning is then pondering is the considering of an issue without necessarily coming to a resolution or a conclusion. If you've ever had a conversation with a woman, you will know that oftentimes the conversation does not lead to a conclusion and does not need to be fixed. And that's also why women, whenever you ask us, honey, what are you thinking? And we say nothing. It's because there's no problem to fix and no conclusion to come to. And we are simply not doing anything. So what I'm saying to you this morning is that you find yourself in a very unique situation where our culture is suggesting to you that you do way more pondering and a lot less thinking. And what we need, and what I'm going to challenge you with this morning, is that to develop a compelling vision of what is best, you are going to have to start thinking. Because it requires you to come to a necessary conclusion, a resolution about the things that are going on around you. Pop culture is going to suggest to you a lot of different things. And, and, and so I'm going to draw from some, uh, some things or some, maybe some things you've seen on TikTok or uh, cl- clips or something that you've seen on reels or whatever it is. And so these names hopefully will be familiar to you. If you've not heard of Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, I'm sure you probably will at some point. And if you've not heard of Warren Buffett, then you probably will at some point. And these are the types of people that are beginning to shape kind of the conservative movement of our culture. And you say, well, that's not really a biblical conservative conservative movement of the culture, you're right. But what they're doing is they're, they're, they're selling you a bill of goods that sounds really neat and really compelling, but it has no substance to it because what they're banking on is that you're just going to ponder it and not think about it. Because what happens when you begin to think about the things that the culture is selling you, and you come to a necessary resolution and conclusion, you will have to weigh it against the scale of Scripture. And so I'm going to do this with you this morning. And so if you want to, you can turn to uh, the, the book of Colossians. And I want to give you then, the, and this is the title, the, A Compelling Vision of What is Best. And so in pop culture, here's what I'm gonna, we're going to attack first. Is this is a quote from Jordan Peterson. He says, the lack of your best hurts everything. 
Now, first time I heard that, I thought, I kind of like that. In fact, it's kind of one of the things that I, I think is interesting about um, education and uh, bettering yourself and doing all those different things is that it, when I don't give my best, I actually do hurt everything. I hurt my family. I hurt my church. I hurt my, my kids. I hurt my, my business. I hurt my, my extended family, all of those things. But now I begin to think, well, what, what, why did he say that? The reason why he said that is because what he wants is for you to be a better person because he thinks if you're a better person, then you'll have a better life. Warren Buffett has been quoted to say that the very best thing that you can do is to be exceptional at something. Now, I, I, I think this is a great idea. And you probably need to develop more of this. And, and far too many of you as college students and young people are, are living in a, in a dream world where you think somehow you're going to be a part of the top half percent of something and, you're, and because you think it sounds good or you think it might make you money or you think it was something that somebody you saw that was popular on the internet is doing and you want to do that. Well, is that actually something you're good at? And is it something you can actually become exceptional at? Warren Buffett says you, you need to do that. You need to find the thing that you can be exceptional at and then give everything to that thing. So let's now redeem these two ideas through the lens of Scripture. And this is found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 30, or verse 23 through 24. And I think it's on the screen, yeah. So I'll read that for you. And it says this. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Peterson says the lack of your best hurts everything. Scripture says the lack of giving your best actually robs God of the glory that he deserves in your life. Years ago, I was sitting at the my kitchen table with a group of young guys in high school. They would come over to my house. Um, and this is, uh, this is kind of weird. I, I'm just now adjusting to being an older guy in the room. So I used to be the token young guy. And I could hang out and I can do it. And by the way, if you want to play ping pong, I brought my paddle and I'll whoop you later. So, um, so I, I'm cool with that. I can hang with the college kids and, never, and I, I kind of look like one. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm all right with that. And um, other than the fact that my hair's growing gray now, um, is, you know, I'm, I'm just now adjusting to the fact that I'm a, a younger, I'm not the young guy anymore. And so um, it, it's weird to me. But as I looked at this, and I was sitting at the table with them years ago, uh, one of the guys asked me, because this was the, the deal, if you come to breakfast at my house, you have to come with two questions, a life question and a, and a scripture question, something about the Bible. And so he asked me, he said, do I have to go to college? I said, well, um, I guess the answer is no, you don't have to go to college. But consider this. If you know that you are capable of more and you refuse to do it, then you are robbing God of the glory that he could potentially get through your life. So when the scripture says, whatever you do, work heartily at it as unto the Lord, meaning that not for you, not for anybody else, but for God, meaning you have to give everything that you've got as if you're working for his name and his sake, and you don't do that, then you are actually robbing God of the glory that he deserves in your life. So it's not just that you're not getting the best out of your life, but God's not getting the best out of your life. To go along with the exceptionalism quote from Warren Buffett, let me suggest to you this morning that exceptionalism is not winning the first place trophy. It is instead receiving the approval of the one who hands out crowns. Think about that for a moment. There are no participation awards in heaven. I don't care what your little league coach told you. I don't care how many medals you've got hanging on your wall because you participated in this or you participated in that. You need to know there's going to be a lot of people 
And when they come to the end of their life, and they meet Jesus face to face, are going to show them their participation awards. Did I not do this thing in your name? Did I not go here? Did I not do this thing? Did I not participate in all of the ministry that might be available to me and to you for your name? And he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. You see, there's something unique about this. And the words are not there because they don't mean anything. The words are there because they are meaningful. And he says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as a reward, there is a first and there is a last place. You either win or you lose in this game. And so I'm, I'm challenging you this morning to think about your life. Are you giving it everything you got? Are you giving your education everything you got? You, you know, I told you the story about telling the, the boys there that morning that if you didn't give God your best, then you were robbing him of the glory that he could get from your life. Um, at the time, I, was, uh, I had an MDiv. I had the highest level of education that my, anyone in my family had ever had. Um, master's degree was all there, there ever was. And the next day, I, I was thumbing through Facebook and, uh, and an ad at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary popped up and said, uh, doctorate of ministry degree, now on sale. And I was like, huh. Okay, God. <laughs> I see you. I see what you're doing there. And so my wife and I talked about it, and she didn't like it, and I decided I was going to do it. And so I went ahead and, and applied and got my doctorate, and in the process got another master's degree. Why? Not because I wanted more pieces of paper on my wall, which, by the way, I haven't even hung up my doctorate, by the way. Um, and you're probably the I was, I was looking at the thing on the screen. No one calls me Dr. Perry, okay? Um, the only person I make called Dr. Perry is my dad because he doesn't have a doctorate. Uh, and so no, nobody calls me that. But it's weird to see it. And why did I, why did I go through with all of that? Because I didn't want to get to a moment in my life where God needed me to accomplish a task for him, for his kingdom and for his glory, and me not be ready for it. Knowing that I had the time, the effort, and the energy, and the resources to be able to accomplish more and not do it was to rob from him the glory that he would get from my life. And I'm challenging you today to think deeply about whether or not you are withholding something from God that if you were to turn it over to him, he might get more glory from your life. So you say, okay, this is the way this works, and if this is what is kind of this compel part of this compelling vision of what is best, and what is best is for me to give all of who I am to God, for his glory, is it really worth it? Well, turn over a, a page to chapter 1. And while you do, I'll, I'll hit you with another pop culture reference. If you find yourself down a deep, dark hole on YouTube some, somewhere, you'll, you'll often come across a, uh, a, a sermon by Reverend Ike. And Reverend Ike is an African-American pastor who is uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful preacher. And, and I am 100% positive that I am taking his quote out of context. But I also know that he would probably support what I'm going to say about what, what he meant by his, his statement. And so he says, the most important thing in the world is what you believe about yourself. You've probably even been told that. Oh, if you would just change the way you think about yourself, then your life would be different. And so, that, and, and what that means is then they will come in with the encouragement that you're good enough. Oh, you're, you're going to be okay. Oh, it's not as bad as you think it is. And in fact, if somebody told you you were a bad person, you're not a bad person. 
You're good enough. You can achieve anything you put your mind to. You can, you're not, because you're not a bad person. Who would tell you that? Are they just trying to tear down your self-esteem? But the, the issue is then, then how do we solve the world's problems? If I have problems and the way that, and, and the most important thing is what I believe about myself, what happens when things don't go my way? Oh, well, you can solve your problems by just having a better attitude. This is the, this is the whole thing about the you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back idea. Uh, I use this with the couples that I do premarital counseling with. And, uh, and, I, and I tell them, if you've ever read the Five Love, Love Languages book, Gary Smalley type deal, this is, the basic, uh, this is the basic principle, that if you love me the way I'm, I want to be loved or I'm wired to be loved, then I will love you the way that you're wired to be loved. Well, what happens when you, you don't get loved the way that you want to get love? You stop giving love the way the other person wants to give love. And so it becomes a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, but what happens when the back scratching stops? And now you take that whole philosophy and you burn it over into your philosophy about God and you say, well, the only the good things happen to me whenever I do good things, but what happens when I do good things and then I don't get anything good in return? The end result must be God's bad. And so let me suggest to you a more compelling vision of what is best. Look with me. Colossians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 15, going to verse 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of to dwell in him and through him, to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaging in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless, beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in faith, firmly established and steadfast and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Let me suggest to you today that the most important thing is not what you believe about yourself, but it is actually what you believe about Jesus. The most important thing that you could ever come to understand or believe or realize is what you believe about Jesus. If you look at the scripture here, he gives you some some things here right off the bat. What is it I need to know about Jesus? This Jesus that you say is so important to me and what I need to focus all my heart and my attention and my effort and my energy on. What, what, who, what do I need to know about him? First thing you need to know is that Jesus is God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He has always been and will always be. He had no beginning. He has no end. He is the eternal God, Jesus, the second part of the Trinity, Jesus is God, eternal, creator, sustainer. He is in and through all things. And therefore, Jesus is supreme. I love this verse when it comes to uh, to verse 18. He is also the head of the body of the church. And he is the beginning. 
the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Do you get that? There can't be two first places. And what you believe, and the most important thing that you believe in all this world is not what you believe about yourself, it's what you believe about Jesus. And if you believe that Jesus is the most important thing out of everything, I promise you it will change everything. You need to know that Jesus is God. You need to know that Jesus is supreme. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is and deserves first place. Jesus then is also the way and the means of salvation. Why is this important? Well, because the culture is going to tell you there are a lot of other ways. And in fact, if you watched the Grammys the other night, you heard some of our pop culture uh, giants suggesting that we have got it wrong. They suggested that this book doesn't represent the kind of Christianity that is needed in our world today. Well, let me tell you what. If you step outside this book to try to find an alternative version of Christianity, what you will find is an anti-Christianity. It's not worth anything, nor will it save, nor will it be the means by which you can have your sins forgiven. Because look what he says. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaging in evil deeds, which by the way, all of us fall under this category, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh. How? Through death. It is Jesus' death on the cross that provides the way and the means for salvation. And it is of the utmost importance that you get this right. Because the most important thing in the world is what you believe about Jesus. Pop culture would tell you that you are good enough, that you're not a bad person that you can solve all your problems by just having a better attitude. But the scripture reminds us that I'm not good enough. Nor will I ever be apart from Jesus. I'm not good enough. But thank goodness Jesus is. What else do you need to know about yourself? Well, you need to know you are a bad person. And it's not just that you are a bad person because you've done bad things. You're a bad person because you're the kind of person who wants to do bad things. And for those of you who are like, that's not me. All I need to do is take you to the nursery of every single preschool church in the country and you will find sin at its greatest and most exemplary level. You come out of your mother's womb this way, wanting not what God wants, but what you want. You don't need to be taught these things. You have to be taught to be kind. You have to be taught to not bite. You have to be taught to share. Why? Because we're not good people. But thank goodness Jesus gives us his goodness. This is the great swap of the gospel. That God made him who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf so that I might become the righteousness of Christ. This is the great swap. God takes the punishment I should have gotten because I'm a bad person and I'm not good enough and he puts it on the perfect person of Jesus Christ, the God-man, 
And there on the cross, he pays the penalty for my sin so that when God looks down at the cross, he sees me. And when he looks down at me, he sees Jesus. You can't solve your own problems by simply having a better attitude. But Jesus can bring peace and reconciliation where there's chaos. The chaos of your heart may be raging right now. I'm not naive enough to think, I I went to this school, and I sat where you're sitting. I'm not naive enough to think that there are not people here today who have yet to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And yet I also know there are a bunch of you here who were raised in church, who came to a Christian university because that's simply what you did. You didn't have another choice. You didn't want to make grandma mad, and so you came to a Christian university. But you've probably never seriously thought about what it means to actually be a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of you here are mad. You're mad at God. You're mad at every vestige of biblical faith because everything you have ever seen or everything you have ever heard didn't turn out well for you. Well, let me tell you, no matter what category you find yourself in this morning, decide right now that you're not just going to ponder these things. but that you will seriously and honestly think coming to a necessary resolution or conclusion about what is the most compelling vision of what is best for you. I've offered you my thought. And the conclusion I came to is that the most important thing to believe about myself is that I need Jesus. I have to have him because apart from him, I've discovered I have nothing. This morning you have the choice, the same choice. Will you choose Jesus, or will you on your own try to come up with a more compelling vision of what is best? My prayer for you is this, trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word, to think about what it is that you've said, and to come to a necessary conclusion that leads us to the reality that you are the most important thing out of all the things And that because you're the most important thing out of all the things, that that means you deserve all of who I am. And not just the the pieces of the left, the leftover pieces uh, uh, that I I have after I've given my best to my business and given my best to my sports and given my best to my academics and given my best to my friends and my family. No, you deserve the best because you you, you deserve the first part, not the leftovers. Because I know there's something real at stake here. And most importantly, it's your glory. So, Lord, I pray for these students as they wrestle and as they think. That you would draw them closer to you. That you would help them as they, as they deal with the issues of the culture. And, they, and they, they read them through the lens of scripture. And they weigh them through the scale of your spirit. And they do that so that they might be stronger, that they might be better, but they might also be more useful for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, I pray for this university as it continues to turn out people with a high level of education and a mission to serve the world for Christ. Continue to raise up leaders 
continue to bring students here that they might be a part of this culture that is seeking to change the world. And Lord, that you would breathe life into all that we do for your name and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.